Today, we're going to learn about CIP or SIP messaging between two micro 800 PLCs. And this works with all micro 800 Ethernet PLCs. This is the native protocol that the micro 800s, the control logics, and the compact logics PLCs use to communicate. We also could do it with Modbus TCP, and we're going to learn about it in a future video. Now, for you who are watching this through our Festo Didactic MedClab series, I need to give you a little more details on our IP address. Since we have four PLCs now, we are going to need to change our IP addresses because they all have to be unique. 192.168.144, that is going to be the PLC trainer that we are going to be doing our programming in. 192.168.121 is going to be our handling PLC. 192.168.122 is going to be our conveyor PLC. And 192.168.122. 123 is going to be our stacking PLC. Let's start with a new program. And also for you who are following along with the Festo series, do not overwrite the PLC programs that you have already made because we're going to copy and paste some code out of those probably to save you some time. This one is going to be my handling PLC. And go to controllers. And this will work with everything from the Micro 820 through the Micro 870. I have a Micro 850, an L50E, and it's a 2080 L50E 24 QBB. Select and add to project. And as usual, it's very important that we set the IP address of our PLC, but also that we know exactly which PLC's IP address we are using. And I see a lot of people get confused on this is you really need a spreadsheet or you need some way to track your IP addresses out in the field. But this one will be 192.168.121. So I'm going to put in here 192.168.121. And we're going to stick with the default subnet of 255.255.255.0. And we have an additional challenge. And that is our name of our controller. Notice this one says Micro 850 because this is actually the PLC that we have been working with throughout this Festo series. And then this one down here says Micro 850 because this is the standard PLC trainer that I use in videos. The default name that you see here comes from the PLC you select, and it's actually right here, the controller name. In fact, let me go back to the default theme. This is the way yours probably will look. And yeah, we have Micro 850 here. That's where the name's coming from. So I'm going to right-click it, and I want to rename it. And this will be my handling. And when we download this, we will go back and look at that factory talk view and see that it makes it a lot easier to figure your PLCs out. Now, I am going to configure all the messaging in our main PLC. That way we can learn about the read or write and do not skip parts of this video. Watch it all the way to the end because I'm going to give you at least some very good opinions on when you should use a read message and when you should use a write message. But for this case, we are going to simply right-click programs, add ladder diagram. We'll open it up and then let's open up our global variables. And one difference between Studio 5000 and the Micro 800 is in Studio 5000, our address would be something like local colon one colon I dot data. And we could simply copy that to a double integer and then read it out to another PLC. In this case, we don't have this at what we call the word level. So we're going to have to get all of these into an integer for us to read across the network. So let's go down to the bottom of our global variables and we are gonna put in inputs from main PLC. And then its data type is going to be a double integer. Now arguably we could get away with a integer here or a 16-bit integer, but I would make it a double integer. We could pass some other things back and forth later. And we'll press enter. And then let's put outputs from main PLC and also make it a double integer. Now let's get back to our program and we're going to simply map our inputs and outputs over to it. So I'm going to bring down a new rung and bring down a go look for a one. 
And we are going to go look for one at underscore IO EMDI00. That'll be digital input zero. And then we are going to put an output energize. And this will be our inputs to main PLC. And at the end of it, we're going to put dot zero. Now we're going to right click that and we're going to copy it. And then we're going to paste it the number of times we have inputs. And that's going to be one through 13. So right click, paste, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. And now we're gonna go through each one of them and just increment. So we have one here, we have one here, and we'll continue that all the way down. And when you're finished, you should have zero through 13. And a real quick check is, Remember, our rung numbers and connected components start with a one, even though our inputs start with a zero. So we're gonna add one to that final one. 13 should be on rung 14. Now let me show you what I mean by, this is a lot easier in studio, is I can go over to my move logical tab and bring down a move instruction, and I could go find local colon one colon i dot data, and don't put anything on it, and I could put this into, my input states and I create that and we would be done instead of needing those 14 rungs of code. And I really feel that should exist. So if you know how to do that, please put it down in the comments for us. Now we need to do the opposite for our outputs. So we'll go ahead and bring you a new rung down. And this time on the left side, we are going to put our outputs from main PLC.0, and we are going to put an output energize to our IOEMD000. And same thing, we're going to do this for 00 through 09. And when you're done, you should have outputs 0 through outputs 9. As I was creating that length, I realized I did not set us up for future success. We need to make a change to that program. Now open up our global variables. Now for our application, we only need the one double integer. But typically, you're going to want to pull a block of data. You're going to need more than simply one number or 32 bits. We want some actual data here. And to put a dimension in, you simply put the first number that you want in your array such as zero, and then period, period. And in this case, I want 10 elements, so the last one would be nine. And do the same thing on the second one. And after that, if we open this up, we actually have 10 double integers in here. So we're gonna be able to take a block of data and take it from one place to the other. And if we go over here, we notice we got little triangles over here. And that's because now we need to specify the actual array element that we found over here. So I'll widen this column out. Notice this is PLC bracket zero bracket. And so this needs to be PLC bracket zero bracket. And our little yellow triangle goes away. Now that's 24 changes. And that, that seems like a painful way to do it. And I feel it used to be go to edit and there should be a replace button here. We do have a find. But even here, there is no replace. But a few videos ago, we learned that there is actually the latter text input here. And this gives us the actual text that is making up our graphical interface. So let's right click it and select all. That'll grab everything in here. And we're gonna right click and we are gonna copy it. And then we're going to go to our start menu and just start typing notepad. And this is a basic text editor. I'm gonna right click and paste it into. Now I can go to edit and replace. And this is what we ultimately want is PLC bracket zero. So I'm gonna take that back out so they're all the same. And I'm gonna put PLC is what I wanna find, replace with PLC bracket zero bracket. And then apparently I had an error here. I'm not really sure, I didn't catch what was going on there, but that six is missing. And now if I hit the replace all, they are all done. So I can right click, select all, right click, copy, and go back over to my program. 
right click, select all in my text editor, not down in my ladder editor, right click, paste. And if you want really cool tips like that, I do try to put those out when I run into them. Go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And that is going to be all the PLC program that we are going to put into our handler. So we're going to go ahead and download this. And I'm going to walk you through this download because now we have some pitfalls. We, you know, we don't talk a lot about downloading when we have multiple PLCs out on the network. But now you really need to pay attention to what all the prompts are saying. I'm going to open up my Ethernet connections. And yeah, the handling PLC is 192.168.121. And note right now it says Micro 850 on it. I'm going to download to it. And for our application, it does not matter. But typically, I download with project values. And we're getting a warning that downloading Ethernet settings will result in disconnection from controller. Continue with download of Ethernet settings. Now, I really wish this would just scream at you. You're getting ready to change your IP address or something about it. Because you get this prompt normally, and normally it's telling us to put it into run mode. But what I'm going to tell you is anytime you get this prompt, you need to click the no button unless you're absolutely sure that you wanted to change your IP address. Now, I'm doing some networking videos. And in that last Festo Didactic video, I put a gateway address in here for those. And it's not in here, but I still want us to walk through this. So we should always hit no to this unless we're 100% sure that we meant to change that IP address. Now notice, we still get our prompt to put it in the run mode. The program is in there. Everything is going to be fine. I'm going to click yes. And then let's double click on our PLC again. And it says settings in the project are different than the controller. We want to update from the controller. Watch it. It is this gateway address. And that corrects it. Our IP was good though. Okay, let's go back to Factory Talk Network Links Browser. Just so we can see this. See, right now, because I'm not browsing any from earlier videos, if these boxes are not marching, we're not updating this list. But see, both of these say Micro 850. So we'd have to think really hard and know for sure which IP is what. We'll click on this, though. And now that updates to handling. So make your names, and that is this part right here, something memorable. That way we can figure out what our PLC is out on the network. Okay, now we want to leave this one open. We're going to right-click Connected Components Workbench in the bottom and click Connected Components Workbench again. That's going to open up a second copy of it. And here's another reason, if you ever come to my class, I stress so much that names are important is by the end of this, we're going to have four Connected Components Workbench programs open. Names are incredibly important. So when we click New here, do not leave this at Project 16 and hit the Create button. And be honest, how many of you right now says Project Something number on your first one? It seems like right now you're doing your schoolwork or you're just doing a test. That would be, it would be really easy to remember. But in fact, I just got a sticker for it. Eventually, you're going to have way too many tabs open in your brain. And that's why these names are important. So I am going to call this my Festo main PLC. And we'll go to controllers. This is a Micro 850 L50E also. It's a 2080 L50E 24 QBB. Select, add to project. And while that's loading, let's open Factory Talk Links back open. I shouldn't even closed it. So this is the one that I have assigned as 192.168.144. So I'm going to first off go to my Ethernet. And we are going to select configure address and we're going to put 192.168.144. It is a subnet of 255.255.255.0. And since I am getting ready to do some networking videos, I'm going to put that gateway back in. And you do not need to do this for your setup. Now let's right click programs, add ladder diagram, and open up Prog 1 and bring down an instruction block. And we'll double click on it. And this time we are doing SIP or CIP messaging. So if you type CIP in, you're gonna get two CIP messages. We have a CIP explicit message, and that actually opens it up to the nuts and bolts of the class instance and assembly. 
But we also have the symbolic message. And if you're communicating with something that does this natively, it's a little bit easier to use. We're back to this whole truncation thing here. And for this one, I want to be able to see all this because right now I got a mouse over it and figure out that symbolic config and all that. So right click over to the right of your ladder and go to properties and let's change this element width to six. That way we can read the actual words here. Now our first one, we are going to be doing a read message from the other PLC. So I am gonna call this one my read control. I'm gonna call this one my read symbolic. And notice it already knows what data type to do since we're double clicking on them this way. Then this one will be my read target. This one will be my read data. And on the right side, we want our read status and our read data length. And we're going to need to know something about this. So highlight the message command and hit the F1 key. That's going to bring up the help for this. And we're going to need a few bits of information here. So go down a little bit. And we have our control config. Right click it. Open a new tab. And we have our CIP symbolic config, right click it, open new tab. And then we have our target config, right click it and open a new tab. And don't be tidy during this because we're gonna need to bounce back and forth between these. But let's first look at the CIP config. We have a cancel and yeah, that does exactly what you think. But then we have a trigger type. And the trigger type is important. A lot of you, when you go to and do this, you're like, well, it only worked one time and now I'm not getting anything. It's only going to execute when that message instruction goes true. But we can also put a value in here and it'll make it repeat it. Now, I am going to put a value of 20 in here. And I'm not putting a lot of science behind that. I'm just kind of coming up with a value. So we're going to double click on the bottom part where we have read control. That brings up our variable selector and then hit your arrow by it. And we have our trigger. And for our project value, because if we download project values that go along with it, that can be our baseline to get us started. So I'm going to put a 20 in there. We may need to change it, but we can later on. Whoops. And <laughs> here is the downside of doing it. Notice we have a mismatch now because while it brings up the editor and lets you do it really quickly, if I hit the OK button, it actually selected what I was on. This still needs to be the whole read control. Well, there's a quick way to do it. We also can double click on local variables over here and we could get to them right here. And the next one we need to understand is the symbolic config. So again, don't close the tabs. Let's just go to the next one over. And this one, we have a service code, which is going to be whether we're reading or we're writing. In this case, this is a read message. We can leave it as default. And then we have a string here, which is the variable to read write. Okay, now here's where it's important that we keep track of where we're at, is we are going to be reading the inputs. And our inputs are named inputs underscore from underscore main underscore PLC. You don't want the bracket zero or any of that. So we'll go over here and we will get the symbolic config open. And here is the string. And in the project value, we're going to put inputs from main PLC. And this one is one to make sure you double check because if there is anything wrong with what is written here, your message instruction is not going to work. Okay, right, let's go back over to our help file. And the next thing is the number of elements we want to read. And even though we're only using one element right now, let's go ahead and do all 10 elements. One, that way we can play with passing numbers back and forth and learn some other things while we're at it. So for our count, we are going to put in a value of 10. And we'll go back over here. And the other ones really don't need adjusted. So finally, we have a target config. And again, here's where it becomes really important that we understand what PLC we're in and what PLC we are going to. So we have a path first, and this is a target, and it can handle multi-hops. We may do that in another video. 
But first, we have a port number. And I know the port number off the top of my head, but I just want to see, does the help actually help us with the port number? In fact, I'm going to control F for port. And serial port. Communications protocol support. It does not. So we're going to put four and then the IP address of our target PLC. Now, going back to factory talk links, we are programming in this one. This is our main Festo PLC. It's just as micro 850 because we have not actually written this program to it yet. But we're going to be reading this from the handling PLC. That is our target. So we're going to be 4, 192, 168, 121. So we'll open up our read target. And for our string there, it will be 4, 192, 168, 121. We're back over here. And the next is whether we want to use an unconnected message or a class three connection. And for what we're doing, the unconnected is fine. You can read more about the details of that. And then we have the time out here. And mainly if it's set to zero, the default value will be three seconds and that'll be fine for us. And then same with this one. If it was a connected message, it would be a 10 second time out. If it was a zero, so we'll leave it like it is. And we do have the close connection. and. And occasionally I'll see a situation where we need to close the connection, but for the most part, we can leave this at false. That'll leave the connection open and we'll be good to go. All right, let's go ahead and download this program. And again, we got to pay attention to which PLC we are actually downloading to. We're going over Ethernet, and this is this main one here, which right now is still labeled as 850. As soon as we download this, it, ooh, wait up. I didn't change the name of this. Look at there. Well, if you forget to, just right click, rename. This is going to be our Festo main. And I'm going to hit the download button again. And the download project values works just fine. We'll go ahead and put that back into run mode. And our read status is true. And our data length is zero. That's a sign of something not working. Now, one thing to be really aware of here is there's no real obvious error like we have in Studio 5000. But if we double click on the status and open it up, that's going to bring up our error IDs. And we do have an error. And it says error 33, sub error ID is 48. And that's why we left our Microsoft Edge tabs open. It is that way we can go find it here. And let's go ahead and just search in here for error ID. And we are looking for our message error ID. And here you go, CIP status error codes. And so on this, we had error ID 33, sub error 48. And here is error 33, sub error. The instruction blocks input data array size is not sufficient. Ah, yep, they are correct. So earlier I just had us going through just creating these. Double click on our read data and open it up. We only have one block of data available and we need 10 blocks of data available right here. Actually, we need more than that because, oh, all right, well, we're going to get a little bit of a data type exercise here because Notice we have read data zero through seven. That's all that's in here. And if we go to our handling program and open up our global variables, in this we have 32 bits, zero through 31. So since we have 10 array elements, we actually need 40 for that size. And we have some videos talking through figuring out your data sizes, and you can go check those out. But we're going to need to disconnect here, and then double-click here on the bottom part of the read data. Also notice, you know, earlier over here, I put for our array 0 through 9, because I come from Studio 5000, and 0 is a number. But it actually defaults a lot of times in Connected Components Workbench to... One. So this 1 through 40 would be the same as 0 through 39. Let's go ahead and download that. 
And now our read status is false. And this is kind of confusing. This really should say error or something. But yeah, if this is false, you're usually really good. Here's the other indication is we do see that we are getting data. This has turned into a 40. Now, notice they're kind of bouncing a little bit. Even if we look over here, we're bouncing a little bit. Well, not going to bounce now that we're staring at it. Yeah, there it goes. So see, it just went from a four to a zero to a four to a zero. So this data right here changes when this executes. Whenever this instruction executes again, which right now we have it executing every 20 milliseconds after this is read, it's going to set this to zero. And I see a lot of you do that. You try to use this read data and you can't figure out why your data is kind of bouncing all over the place. That's why. So we need to copy this data once this message has been read. And if we go back to our status and go down a little bit on our control config, here is the execution of this. So we have our ladder diagram scanning and it's just hitting whenever. We have our enable bit and that's based on our 20 millisecond RPI. And then we have the done that will actually be done once the message is read. We also have an error bit and we probably should do something about it. But for this video, we're just going to use the done bit. So let's go ahead and go offline and we'll bring down a new wrong. You could put it in the same one, arguably. We're going to go look for a one in our read status. And actually, I should show you probably how we figure this out. If we go back to our help. I went and found the error status codes, the CIP status data type. That's what we need to look at. And so we have status bits inside of it. And there is the done bit. It's going to be bit four. So in our case, it will be read status dot status bits and then number four. Let's go to this read status. And when I put a period behind it, it's going to bring up the status bits. And then and behind it, I'm going to put a dot four. And that'll get that. And then let's bring an instruction block down and we want to copy that data. And so our source is this read data. So read data. Now our source offset will be zero. And then our destination is where we want to put it. And so now I'm going to go and call this my handling inputs. And then its data type will be a double integer. And we want its values, just so it lines up with what we have over there, we're going to make it 0 through 9. And then the length. Let's hit the help so we can understand the length, because lengths on copy get confusing. Because the length is based on the number of destination elements to copy. Because in our source, there's actually 40 elements here. But we're putting them into our destination, which is double integers. And so that is going to be a length of 10. So let's go ahead and download that. And now we have some data in our handling inputs. But notice this number is way the heck high compared to this number right here. Let's double click on it and open up our arrow. And if we scroll down, it's actually in the 18th bit. So the first one will be 0 through 15, and then we're jumping up to here. Now let's disconnect from that PLC and go back to our handling PLC and connect to it. And notice it is that second bit. So what's happening here is over in this PLC, it is swapping the first 16 bits with the second 16 bits. And we can fix that, but one, this video is getting really long, and we still have two major points, so I think I will break those out. Is first, how do we fix this deal? And also, we need to talk about the read messages. So here's a playlist with both of those.